Okay, so I think we can start because, um, yeah, it's uh, people will keep coming in. So um, my name is Amina Yakin. I'm chair of the Center for the Study of Pakistan, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's webinar. And um, I'm literally just going to be handing over the reins to uh, the host who will be chairing you through this session. Um, and um, this this. I'm, I'm very, very grateful to the speakers and to um, the who came together and agreed to do this panel and are joining us from different time zones at um, in different locations in the world. So thank you all for being here with us today. For me, it's um, really important to have a conversation about televisual uh, Pakistan in the seminar series for the Center for Pakistan, we um, cover a range of topics and contexts and uh, my own um, interest is also very much connected to how we think about the politics of culture in Pakistan. So to me, this seems uh, an important um, landmark special issue on, um, on Pakistan that we will all be eager to hear about and learn about. So without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce Professor Rosie Thomas, who is a Professor of Film at the Centre for Research and Education, Arts and Media at the University of Westminster. Her early research as a social anthropologist was in the Bombay film industry and since 1985 she has published widely on Indian cinema. She's co-founder and co-editor of Bioscope South Asian Screen Studies, her monograph Bombay before Bollywood film City Fantasies was, was published in 2013. Rosie, uh, Professor Thomas is co-editor of uh, this special issue with uh, Dr. Salma Sadiq, who I had the pleasure to meet at a conference in Lahore. And here we are many years later reconnecting again. Um, so this is, um, to welcome all of you and also to welcome all our participants who are joining today and some who will be listening later to the recorded version. Um, and, and before I hand over to Rosie, I'd also just like to thank Sunil in the background who is doing all the technical facilitation for the session and has been putting in a lot of work to get this thing organized and up and running. So thank you Sunil and um, welcome Professor Thomas. Okay, thank you, Amina, for that introduction. And uh, thank you for hosting us and organizing this event, which I think we're all looking forward to very much. Um, and thank you, Sunil, for doing all the hard work behind the scenes. Um, so it's actually wonderful to have a, a chance for the participants, uh, several of, or most of us have never actually uh, met even virtually before, um, and to have a bit of a discussion about this, uh, this special issue, which took up quite a bit of our lives um, a couple of years ago. It was actually uh, finally published um, uh, in, uh, uh, January 2020, was it? December 2019. Um, but it had actually been in process um, for a few years before that. So as I'll explain in, in a moment. So it's an important moment for us to come together and actually have a chance to, to speak about it. Um, the way that the webinar will work, um, we've asked each of the uh, four speakers to speak for about 10 minutes each. Um, and then Amina will be a respondent. Um, and so that will take up the first 50 minutes or so. And the final 40 minutes um, will be for Q&A. And I'd like to invite your our audience um, to put their questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box. Um, and that means I can monitor the uh, Q&A uh, box and um, hopefully get through as many questions, depending on how many questions you have, get through as much as possible. So we're looking forward to feedback. We're looking forward to a discussion. Um, and I hope, I hope uh, this is something that uh, is useful and interesting for everyone. 
Uh, the journal uh, is special issue um, came to pass. Um, the idea was brought to us about three or four years ago, following uh, one of my co-editors uh, who had uh, seen a panel of early career researchers um, at the Madison conference and uh, fed back that there's an exciting new group of uh, early career PhD students working on India on Pakistani television um, and that it might make a good a good a good theme and a topic for a uh, um, for one of our upcoming issues. Um, it was something that uh, for me was uh, personally very exciting. Um, I've been running the Evening South Asia Journalism Programme at Westminster for the past eight or nine years. Um, so we've had a small cohort of mid-career journalists from across South Asia in London for eight weeks each year. So I'd been hearing firsthand about what was happening on the ground for print and television and web journalists in Pakistan. I'd been visiting Pakistan each winter and had seen the extraordinary changes that were happening from 2012 through to uh, 2020 when I was, uh, was last there, but through to 2018, 19, when this, uh, this journal took off. Um, and um, I think I and my co-editors felt that a Bioscope special issue would be a useful place to explore and contextualize all this. Moreover, um, there was, it was a, the television space um, in Pakistan was more or less absent with, uh, within academic work at that time, with notable exceptions, including Amina. Um, but uh, while Bioscope had hosted an issue on cinema from Pakistan a few years ago, um, this seemed like something new and fresh. Um, and we felt that exploring this vibrant and very unique media space would allow us to make some sort of a significant intervention, both empirically and theoretically. In particular, um, what the case study of Pakistan reveals about the mass media and its very various entanglements today. It does seem a very unique space, obviously with parallels elsewhere in the world, but uh, it's, it was worth exploring. Um, we um, agreed to work with uh, the uh, people from that panel um, who wanted to, a couple dropped out, um, and then we did a, a, a call for papers and got quite a healthy response. And interestingly, um, the majority from early career researchers. It was clearly, or PhD students, it's clearly a field that um, was, was attracting a, a, new, a new set of researchers. Um, and from these, we selected a group that spanned the field and we thought complemented each other to make what we hoped would be a balanced issue. So what we have in the uh, issue, for those who haven't been able to look at it properly, we have two articles and a fieldwork piece on drama broadly, two articles and a fieldwork piece on news broadly, and two articles that are more left field and much more about cross-border flows and uh, different entanglements of entertainment. Um, so, um, of, of course, there could have been much more. Um, we could have included something on talk shows, but actually this was the one area where some significant work had already been done. Um, and sadly, we lost a couple of uh, uh, contributors through time pressures, um, including uh, one with great potential on the popularity of Turkish TV dramas in Pakistan. Um, so they didn't make it to the special issue, but they're still in play and are being revised for a future non-specialist issue of Bioscope. So in a sense, we haven't lost anything um, and it's in the nature of journals that <laughs> we have a time pressure, we come out when we have to and what's ready is ready and what isn't isn't. Um, so 
Of the two articles on drama, um, one by Aisha, who is here today and will speak shortly, um, one by Elliot Montpellier on uh, Mirato Larus and Pious Publics, um, and um, a rather wonderful fieldwork piece that Shruchi Kotari um, gave us based on 1990s interviews with the uh, drama serial writer Hasina Moyne. Uh, on uh, news, we have Aisha, who's here today and will speak for herself. And we have Asif Akhtar, who um, had a fascinating piece on broadcast media censorship in colonial times and now, and does um, a comparison between the, the two regimes and finds some striking parallels including a sort of a Deleuzian um, uh, mechanism um, in, in play in that. Um, and we also have um, a fieldwork piece which we felt was particularly important um, by uh, Bada Alam, uh, who's a journalist who we'd come across through uh, the evening program, um, who was the editor of the Karachi-based Herald um, until he lost his job just a few months before we were going to go to press. Um, and I think what, what's very striking, we, we felt we had a lot of material and the nature of academic work is that by the time it's published, it's often out of date. Things were changing so quickly in Pakistan over those years. Um, that we felt it was really important to have something, especially since 2018. And Badr Alam's very personal stories about censorship in media newsrooms since 2018, and a very reflective piece on the background history, uh, actually gave us that up-to-date currency, which um, I, think, I think helps. Um, the other two, uh, what I refer to as more sort of left field articles, neither strictly drama nor news. Um, one was uh, by Rafael Mahmoud and uh, uh, Richard Williams. Um, and uh, Rafael is going to be talking about to this today on Coke Studio. Um, and the other was uh, by Ritika Pant on Pakistani television serials in India and the cross-border flows, um, which is obviously very much a, a theme that uh, interests us. And, uh, and I think, you know, is something in the way that media studies has to go in the modern world. And before we move into uh, this, I'd like to say, um, what a pleasure it was working very closely with my co-editor on this, Salma Siddique, who will be um, who will be speaking today as well. Um, it was very much a, a joint venture, and um, I think we both enjoyed the process of getting to getting to grips with this field. So. Um, We'll move straight on to the first of our contributors. Um, and I'd like to invite uh, um, Aisha uh, Muller, who's a PhD candidate in anthropology at the University of Chicago, and currently a lecturer in critical media studies at the University of Texas at Dallas. Um, and she's going to talk to her paper called Mazanahi Aya, Negotiating Sensationalism in Pakistani Television News Practices. Ayesha, over to you. Thanks so much, Rosie. Uh, it's great to be here with all of you. Um, and yes, as you mentioned, so much has certainly changed uh, in the news media industry uh, since the time of my field work, and uh, even since the time that this issue has been published last year. But um, I have to say, I think, unfortunately, some things have also stayed the same uh, when it comes to sensationalist television news in Pakistan. Uh, so what I'd like to do with my allotted time is just quickly recap some of the key points of my article, uh, and I hope we can continue the conversation, uh, maybe with more recent examples uh, in the Q&A session. 
Um, so at the time of my research in 2015, I was primarily interested in exploring the ways in which a particular class of Pakistani broadcast journalists negotiated sensationalist practices in television news, specifically those who had transitioned to the production of Urdu television news after working with English language newspapers. My initial focus on this exclusive professional cohort did not aim to privilege elite liberal anxieties, but rather to understand the context from which their critiques arise and the implications of their relationship to power. The socio-political ramifications of a privatized media landscape in Pakistan led to the rapid growth of an industry that continues to rely on an available labor pool of largely lower middle-class applicants with television news organizations having to train their entry-level employees on the job. In 2013, the Pakistan Federal Union of Journalists surmised that at least 18,000 new journalists had entered the workforce, of whom almost 70% had no formal training in journalism and less than 5% were women. The hiring of untrained media personnel is an indication of the ways in which young broadcast journalists in Pakistan are not only tasked with producing affective news, but are also expected to act as authentic cultural mediators between corporate news channels and mass audiences. Stereotypical examples in liberal elite commentary on recently recruited untrained reporters being sent off to cover breaking news events uh, invariably frames them as scrambling through police cordoned areas after bomb explosions, contaminating crime scenes, um, or entering into the houses of the victims of such attacks, shoving cameras and microphones into grieving family members' faces, and asking them inane questions in between their wails. Caught between the ratings race to deliver breaking news footage to their respective newsrooms and being simultaneously scapegoated by their corporate management when they step out of bounds, the rawness of the untrained journalist has come to conveniently stand in for the media industry on its worst days. While we cannot deny the reality of such instances, my main argument in the article is to analyze the prevailing discourse on the ethics of journalism in Pakistan as a productive site through which the differences between privileged and vulnerable media labor emerges as most apparent. The dilemma facing English language print journalists now employed in Urdu news media meant turning away from a trained BBC model of serious sober journalism and tuning their craft to a localized set of dramatic news practices. One of my interlocutors was quite forthcoming in recalling one of his first assignments of putting together a news package. His news bureau chief sent him to Faisalabad to start producing local news stories for the primary reason that people rating meters, um, devices used for measuring television ratings, had recently been installed in the city's households. Uh, and these are now his words. Once there was continuous load shedding and a group of people had gathered to protest outside one of the power companies, we shot a few scenes of footage, sent it back to the chief in Lahore, and he replied with a text message, Mazanayaya. Um, that wasn't entertaining. And he told us to gather more people, burn a few tires, raise louder slogans. So we did. Suddenly, we had a sizable protest with flames and an agitated crowd. All the news channel vans started reaching our Faisalabad protest site, and the event received considerable coverage. All the while, those damn people meters ticked away. This encounter with that ubiquitous catchphrase of the editing room, Maza Nehiaya, resulted in my interlocutor crafting the quintessentially angry South Asian crowd, conveniently packaged for the 9 p.m. news bulletin, complete with flaming tires. The phrase mazaniaya is not only an assessment, so this wasn't fun, but it has acquired for many of the media professionals I spoke with the salience of an unspoken truth. The news can be made entertaining, and you'll know it when you see it. In order to engage with this proposition seriously, I started noting the distinctions between what my interlocutors considered to be sensational news and unethical news practices, and found that the boundary lines drawn between the two were sketched along the use value of that particular news story. Fox and news channels are notorious for airing news without verifying sources and are not unique in blurring facts in exchange for sensational headlines. In cases where the discussion involved celebrity news anchors, criticism of their sensational content was delivered swiftly and unanimously. 
the understanding being that when highly paid media personalities pull in large numbers of viewers, they have a higher responsibility to deliver accurate news content without twisting facts to stir up controversy. An episode from late 2010 was often referenced in my conversations in which popular news anchor Meher Bukhari deliberately misconstrued then Governor Salman Tassir's efforts to advocate for a victim of a blasphemy case. And the anchor accused him of being a blasphemer himself during a live interview. He was shockingly assassinated a month later and his death was largely seen by liberal elites as a senseless consequence of his portrayal in the media. Not surprisingly, a media executive in charge of Bukhari's show did not share this view when I asked about the particular episode as a glaring example of sensationalizing a sensitive issue. And these are his words. Yes, it was my program, but Meher Bukhari cannot be held responsible. I cannot be held responsible. The channel, Sama, cannot be held responsible. Because look, I can ask you questions during an interview, however controversial they may be, but the answers that you give only you can be held responsible for that. While it was tempting to dismiss this poorly aimed attempt to shift the burden of accountability, the executive's response does expose the chain of command that broadcast journalists must navigate when weighing decisions on crafting sensational news. Barring a few rare exceptions, the editors in chief of most Fox news channels are de facto also the owners of their individual private media groups. The political agendas of each news channel are thus identifiable by the content that they produce, whether anti-government or pro-establishment, depending, and especially in 2014, 2016, on the particular history of the channel CEO with the current ruling political party. The irony of young, untrained, and middle to lower class journalists reporting upwards to a chain of media professionals that ultimately ends with an elite, politically motivated, untrained editor-in-chief was not lost on my interlocutors and was simply a sobering reality for the business model of much of the Pakistani media landscape. Dramatic and emotional news coverage was understood as an industry standard, along with the established use of popular music in news headlines and exaggerated speculations in an effort to break a particular news story first. For many, the boundary line between sensational and unethical lay in the greater purpose of the news story itself, um, as explained in the words of this senior producer. Uh, and these are her words. For me, the ends justify the means. If you're shining a light on an important issue, then you need it to be dhamakedar, explosive. And that's fine. But putting music to footage of a supermodel walking up to a court hearing or, I don't know, looping footage of a policeman getting slapped, that has no real value. By value, I mean it has no impact on society. If you're not contributing to any substantial discourse of the society, it may not be unethical, but you're doing news wrong. Upper class journalists who expressed ridicule towards the state of current broadcasting practices in Urdu news nonetheless acknowledged that it was through such practices that channels were able to attract mass audiences and thus secure the advertising needed to keep them in business. The need to stay in business was of course often rephrased as the responsibility to deliver the news to impressionable people who made up the majority of the voting electorate and who despite their pitied illiteracy were now fluent consumers of the liberal free market. The professional vulnerability of lower middle-class journalists is thrown into sharp relief when the work they're expected to produce be it visually compelling spectacles or reporting at the cost of falsifying facts, is both peddled by elite news professionals as the only way to attract mass audiences and is also critically rejected as crass sensationalism. So I'm just gonna stop reading from my article now uh, and hope that elicits some kind of reaction to maybe more recent examples in Q&A. So thank you. Right. Thank you very much, Aisha, and thank you for keeping to time. That's beautiful. Um, okay, um, the next uh, speaker is Rafay Mehmood. Um, Rafay completed his MA in Creative and Cultural Industries at SOAS with a focus on ethnomusicology and screen studies. And he's currently an adjunct faculty at Habib University and the culture editor of the Express Tribune. And his article written in, uh, in collaboration with Richard Williams 
also from Soaz, is a soundtrack for reimagining Pakistan, Coke Studio, Memory, and the music video. Rafe, great pleasure to have you here. Over to you. Thank you so much, Rosie, and thank you, Aisha, for such an engaging talk. Um, as a journalist, I learned quite a lot about the realities of the business. So uh, coming back to uh, the paper we, I and Richard wrote together. So it was interesting because um, I, as a journalist, had investigated a lot into Coke Studio, been a part of the live recordings, seen the process up close and personal, and see how sort of um, an engineered kind of image is being, is being put out there. So the, the thought behind the paper was to essentially come up with an argument and look at a, the impact of something as significant as Coke Studio, which has been termed by a lot of cultural critics, Pakistan's most significant cultural export in the past two decades. Some even say, claim that uh, it's bigger, it's uh, the most significant since Nusrat went to the rest of the world. So, and it's interesting because if you look at the show, the show very much um, takes foundation um, in a very clinical sense from Peter Gabriel's idea of world music and which the founder of the show, Rohail Hayat, who was the, also the founder of the band called Vital Signs, one of the first Pakistani pop bands to come, come to the mainstream media was also inspired by, and hence the name Vital Signs, also inspired by Pink Floyd. So someone like him comes to the mainstream and launches a show which was essentially designed for television. So what we may know of Coke Studio as a YouTube product, but it was never designed for YouTube. It was possibly the first successful interventions of shooting a television show for a music audience. And the reason why I say it successfully is because it managed to gather one of the leading names of the industry put together who had appeal, not just in Pakistan, but also in India, in Bangladesh and rest of the region to come together and make something. But if you look at Coke Studio today, which is 13 seasons down, it was the 12th season that was going on when we uh, completed our field work, our research, and submitted it to Bioscope. It was interesting that Coke Studio's first season was coming out that did not start with a patriotic anthem. So the, the previous five seasons all had started with a patriotic anthem, and Coke Studio had a very strong tagline that they were going for, which was either the sound of the nation, or it was a one nation, one spirit, and one sound. So it was very much the idea behind the paper was to bring together the ideas of nation building and nationhood and look at Coke Studio as a, as a vessel of nation building, um, something that we thought we were approaching from a very unique perspective. But if you look at Coke Studio's last publication, the official Coke Studio table book that came out in 2011, the second edition, it compared itself to the glorious times of the radio Pakistan, when the soldiers would go on the war on, with India and songs such as Shaukat Ali's um, classics and Jag Utha Hai Saira Vatan and Noor Jahan's classics would blare on the speakers. So we, it wasn't it, the attempt that we were trying to, in, uh, that we were making in bringing the ideas about nationhood together became so overt in the end of it that it was almost quite clear that Coke Studio may have started as a music show, but it's very much now a corporate entity that is very much reinforcing a corporized version of the modern Pakistani state, wherever that, that stands and however it stands, whether it's in terms of religious inclusion, whether it is in terms of bringing people from different ethnicities, um, it is to sum it up in a better way, it is something that people want to see Pakistan to be known for more like a vehicle for soft image and something that they don't see otherwise in mainstream media, which is why there's a lot of emphasis on devotional poetry or Sufi poetry per se, that you know, because it's giving a very strong sense of pluralistic version of Islam which also goes back to the pre-partition senses of Muslim nationhood and Muslim brotherhood. So what was interesting for us to know was, we looked at a couple of videos, we looked at 
the prosthetic memories attached to them, which were more like an extensions of it, because when it's now on YouTube, people are forwarding songs on WhatsApp, sharing on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, everywhere. So it was interesting to see the kind of conversations that were developing under the comment section. So two really important things came out. That Coke Studio has become such a huge vessel for cultural change that even in terms of cultural uh, issues related to cultural authorship get um, impacted if Coke Studio takes a certain stance on them. Then the next thing that really came up was that within the comment section of Coke Studio, there's a very interesting transnational debate going on in which a Bangladeshi Canadian who now lives in Toronto is listening to a song by a Pakistani born in East Pakistan and remembering his Bangladeshi nationalhood through that song. And at the same time, we had people saying, Jai Hind, Jai Bangla, we will never forget 1971 under the same song. And the song is sung by Alamgir Pakistan's uh, very much considered the Elvis of Pakistan, a person who migrated to West Pakistan after uh, Bangladesh was formed and then um, very much became the torchbearer of pop music in Pakistan. So he sung um, a folk tune, Ama Bhasha Ili Re, uh, by Jesse Muddin, which was uh, complemented and juxtaposed by some more lyrics that were written to go with the melody. So two things that came up with the two findings. The first case study that we looked at in terms of understanding the problems of authorship was the Kavali Tajda Reharam, um, originally sung and released by EMI Pakistan, sung by the Sabri brothers, um, Ghulam Fahid Sabri and Magbul Sabri in 1975. And it was interesting that Coke Studios version of Tajda Reharam led to a debate about the authorship of that Kavali. And the questions that arose about that authorship was that the Kavali has been written, written by Hakim Mirza Madni, a Mughal prince. And when we go back um, to that, uh, we see that Coke Studio has attributed it to Hakim Mirza Madni and all the resources on internet who had previously, let's say, attributed it to, let's say, Muzaffar Varsi or Purnam Alabadi had changed it to Hakim Mirza Madni. So it was interesting to look at where that was coming from, which was coming from the 1975 leaflet of EMI Pakistan that said Hakim Mirza Madni. And when we went to other places, other platforms on the uh, internet, we realized there were people who were pointing out how this Kavali has been written over the years by different people. And Coke Studio sort of came and put a stamp on it and somehow got associated with the Muslim prince, which was necessarily never the case. And same goes for Ama Bhasha Ili Re, that that song uh, within the Coke Studio comments instilled new kinds of nationalism, a lot of time very transnational attitudes within people living across the globe. And sometimes even, even Indians coming up and saying that, you know, you know, we just want this song, you can take Kashmir. Right, so, so this is the kind of debate that started happening within the song. And then Bangla, the people from Bangladesh coming in and said that only if we could give a tribute like this to the Bangladeshi culture. So it was interesting that um, decades of enmity of political resistance was being resolved within that comment section. And yet it seems to carry on in some way or the other. There seems to be a dialogue there. And to bring it to a close, one thing that came really important where Coke Studio literally became very overt with its political presence was just a day before the polling was to take place for Imran Khan's election, Coke Studio released an anthem earlier than expected, which was a take on Faz Ahmed Faz Hamde Khenge, which was very much an anti-establishment, anti-throne poem which was treated like a devotional piece of poetry in the beginning. And one crit criticism that came back to back was that the original Iqbal Bana version, which was written in resistance to Ziaul Haq, had a lot of anti-establishment and pro-protest verses in it. But this one treated the poem like a devotional take about change, which essentially implied that if you and God are one, then everything is going to change for the better. 
So this is basically the summary of the kind of politics, the kind of nation building, a corporate sponsored beverage show has turned into in the past 13 years since it's began. Thank you. Thanks very much, Rafay. Um, and now uh, we move on to Aisha. Um, Aisha Malik is a research affiliate at the uh, University of Sydney in the Gender and Cultural Studies Department, where she teaches on media and gender. Um, and her paper in this uh, in this article is in this issue is transnational feminist edutainment television in Pakistan, Udari as case study. Okay, over to you, Aisha. Aisha? Um, I think Aisha, yeah, there she is. Thanks. Uh, you're, you're yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I got um, I got cut off. My internet wasn't working. Um, have we done the introductions? Okay, okay. Um, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Aisha. Um, in my work, largely, I trace the production and reception of the Urdu serial drama post deregulation of the Pakistani television industry. Um, but in this article, in the special issue um, of Bioscope, I look at one uh, drama serial in particular, which is Udari. Um, but before I go into Udari as a case study, I wanted to briefly introduce uh, the Urdu serial drama and its uh, history. Is it stuck just for me? Yeah, I think I was just frozen. Yeah, I think we need to get a frozen message for everyone. Across to yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay, maybe Sunil, unless you can uh, find a way through this, maybe we should go on to Salma and um, see whether Aisha's uh, internet uh, access improves. Um, Okay, is that all right, Salma? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, let me introduce uh, Salma Siddiq, who is the principal investigator of a DFG funded film spectatorship project called Nitrate Cities at Humboldt University to Berlin. Um, Salma was an absolutely, as I've already said, um, wonderful support and uh, co colleague collaborator on this special issue and uh, indeed a lot of its intellectual um, excitement is comes from Salma. So over to you Salma to uh, talk about the issue. Thank you Rosie and um, thank you Amina for inviting us today um, and it's it's I'm um, actually uh, sorry that uh, Aisha's um, presentation got disrupted because I was building on it, but I'm sure she can come back and, you know, we can all talk together. So I was going to, um, I'm going to focus on three contributions to the special issue. And um, each of these allow us to think outside of national zones. So my own work focuses on, you know, this kind of cross-border film histories, and I'm always interested in these kind of cross-border media flows, but also the crossing of time zones. And so I'm going to talk about these three contributions, which kind of move away from a conventional understanding of how television broadcasts unite geographically or territorially, yeah? And um, the title, I mean, we called our special issue Television 
Pakistan, but for us, uh, the idea was it was a post network television. So it is about, you know, uh, intermediality. It is about the fact that there is a longer history of different media, but also that the social media platforms are now playing a very important role in uh, making what television is, uh, what it is in Pakistan. So um, we were trying to think through TV audiences in different time zones, uh, researchers in different time zones, and most importantly, uh, past as a different temporal zone. So the first in that order is um, Elliot Mopuller's article on the enduring popularity of 19th century colonial novel, Mirat al-Urs in contemporary Pakistan. And um, his ethnographic fieldwork conducted with writers and producers of the drama industry sees the past Pakistani family unit as both synecdoche for the nation uh, and an important viewing unit used to interpolate audiences. Here, he argues that family duty is the religious adjacent that dominates the drama form. And what Elliot is interested in is uh, understanding how piety is made public, yeah, and how this particular narrative, this um, 19th century narrative, has been regularly adopted in religiously inflected discussions about respectable behaviors. And what um, um, Mopura's article reminds us, of course, are of Pemra's red lines, which compel writers and producers to avoid sectarian and religiously divisive issues. But it hasn't, I mean, we also have to remember it hasn't entirely eliminated religious themes from television dramas. Uh, his argument is nuanced and subtle. Uh, he recognizes that the dramas formulate religious messages as un in unmarked and oblique frames, such as duty, family, emotions, and class. More importantly, the article problematizes the India dominant understanding of the literary scope of Mirat al Urs and the fact that it persists in Pakistan today uh, in television forms points towards the complex genealogy and inheritance of piety in South Asia. So I think that's, that's really uh, very key to uh, Elliot's work here. Uh, a tale can have two endings, depending on the vantage point of the researcher. But if Pakistani family is indeed synecdoche for the nation and an, an important viewing unit, as Mopiris argues, um, used to interpolate audiences of the dramas, how do we understand or explain the popularity of Pakistani serials in India? Uh, Ritika Pant's article on the syndicated television content from Pakistan on the Indian channel Zindagi argues that Pakistani dramas offered a mediating space to Indian audiences by maintaining a balance between Indian tradition and Pakistani modernity. And I think what Ritika does is she draws on this longer history of, you know, the popularity of Pakistani dramas in India, you know, they were making their way in from the 1980s and the 1990s through VHS uh, and CDs and, you know, bootleg economies. And of course, she, um, she also talks about how the cities in the border areas would receive television signals from Pakistan. So if you were living in Punjab or Himachal Pradesh or, you know, one of those border cities, um, families were receiving these signals and watching these dramas. But the syndicated content on television channels had a kind of a circuitous journey. So she draws attention to the complex global media flows through which Indian channels began syndicating content from Pakistani channels to cater to transnational audiences residing in the UK. The popularity of Pakistani TV soaps in the diasporic audiences then paved the way for media flow from one media periphery to another. So it's no longer the north-south flow, but a south-south flow what's happening here. And Pant, Ritika Pant emphasizes that the broadcast of Pakistani serials on Zindagi channel not only challenged the propagandist representation of Pakistani people that the Indian media had been circulating, but it also disrupted the equivalence of foreign as necessarily Western in Indian TV programming. So, and she writes, um, the pleasures of watching foreign TV programming were altered with Pakistani TV serials as Indian audiences for the first time watched foreign content that did not require the cultural capital to comprehend a new language 
or read subtitles. In fact, uh, she writes how some of the serials actually provided viewers with a glossary of Urdu words, uh, you know, and so kind of upgraded the Urdu vocabulary of Indian audiences as well. Finally, and we, we were very delighted to feature this fieldwork piece, uh, Shutri Kothari's interview with one of the highest paid and widely respected writers of her time, Hasina Muin, from the early 1990s. Kothari herself was a pioneer of sorts in the sense that she was working in the early 90s on, as an Indian researcher examining the discourse of Zinana on the production and reception of Urdu drama in Pakistan. When Kothari could not get a visa for another field trip to Karachi as an Indian citizen, she and Hasina decided to meet somewhere else. Kothari writes, the airwaves became that place where we could talk and discuss this project without governmental approval or censor. And Kothari, of course, traces Hasina Moon's rebellion, so to speak. But then uh, she also captures the contradictions uh, of this uh, writer. So Hasina at one point says, Zia Saab loved my plays. Yeah, so it's it's no longer, Zia Saab is not a problem for Hasina Muin. But what is pro what she recounts is the fact that Nawaz Sharif's regime came up with this diktat for PTV, where all women in television had to cover their heads. So this is what Muin said. Then the policy came about and I asked him which sensible mother has a dupatta on her head first thing in the morning in the privacy of their bedroom. Uh, Muin also re uh, recounts that a serial um, made during that time had a drowning woman holding on to her dupatta. So, I mean, there were these series of very incongruous uh, representations that finally led to a kind of a reversal of this policy of dupatta um, during Nawaz Sharif's regime. Kothari is, however, unset unsettled by Muin's dismissal of class as an issue, which I'm very grateful to uh, Aisha's work as well, but um, the newer work around um, television cultures in Pakistan is drawing attention to that. Um, Kothari says that Muin's women who have agency belong to upper or upper middle class families, you know, so she, she reminds us of this fact. And this is also something that Amina has pointed out in her work, um, you know, on the new serials, including Ham Safa, you know, which are, um, uh, critiquing the notions of liberal modern modernity or you know notions of um, liberal notions of womanhood um, so I I think my time is running out Rosie right so I can just maybe take a minute um, so for a long time TV has been considered the medium of respectability in Pakistan I think that that's my reading uh, associated with literary and educated sensibilities this is something that has eluded cinema for for a good part of its existence. And also, you know, as I've recently read this book by Kiran Emma, Digest Fictions, and a lot of writers now from Digest Fictions are making their way into the television industry, also sort of provoking the, um, ang these anxieties around respectability and, you know, what sort of womanhood are we sort of, are, um, are they representing on Pakistani screen? So um, I think in terms of, how to think about future research or what could be productive areas to think of. I think the idea of, you know, this, these different notions of respectability, morality, and creative tastes definitely needs more critical engagement. I would also reiterate if the Kardadi's call for the need for a more comprehensive study that will trace the role of um, social realism from the 1930s well into the Pakistani TV series of the 1990s. So, you know, we become medium agnostic, but look at look at the larger trajectory. And finally, of course, we are very interested in post network television and OTT platforms. So um, I guess maybe in the discussion, we can talk about the feminist detective series, Churel, that sort of created quite a few role in Pakistan recently. That's it, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Salma, that's great. Now, before I introduce, go back to Aisha, I'd just like to, a word to our audience. Um, there are not any questions in the Q&A box yet, um, and please do think about putting them in now so that we don't have a, right at the end, a whole 
tr sort of flood of them and uh, they, they, get, they get lost. So please, let's have some questions coming in. Um, and uh, we'll go back to Aisha, um, who I think is probably going to experiment with keeping her video off um, to make sure that she uh, gets uh, at least yeah. her voice out there. So Aisha, yeah. back to you. Uh, thank you so much, Rosie, and I'm sorry about the disruption, um, and I'm going to keep my video off. Um, I'm glad actually I'm following um, Salma because uh, she talks a little bit about Kotari, Shuchi Kotari, um, and my work also um, builds upon Shuchi Kotari's work and her idea of the Zanana. Uh, however, um, in the time uh, that Shuchi Kotari was doing her work, she was um, working in, a, in the context of a state-controlled broad broadcast television in Pakistan when the drama serial format um, had a very distinct, uh, had a very different sort of content. The, the content that they were tackling, the serial dramas, was very different from the content that uh, serial dramas are tackling right now in a deregulated uh, Pakistani television industry. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, about sort of uh, a little briefly about the sort of content that was being discussed uh, by the, by, you know, sort of by the Pakistani drama serials uh, in the context uh, that Prikutari was talking about. There was, um, in my article, as I discussed, there was an educational um, um, motive embedded in the serial drama format. Um, and while the serial drama format in its initial um, broadcast in, on PTV was targeted at family viewing, we have seen that during various regimes, um, during the Razia regime and during uh, even the Nawaz Sharif regime in 1997, there was a specific target to, towards women um, of uh, these serial dramas, where you know they were trying to um, um, embed certain type of values in, in especially in the um, Sharif um, uh, regime, there's certain sort of conservative values uh, were embedded in the um, in the serial drama. So according to the regime change, the content of the um, uh, serial dramas did change. However, post 2000 in the sort of deregulated Pakistani television industry, uh, we saw a complex uh, set of coordinates emerge uh, that over-determined what I saw as uh, Urdu serial drama's agenda setting rule. So there was a, an eclipse of the progressive social education imperative that was embedded in the format. Um, and so new commercial motivations towards uh, popular appeal began to emerge. And there was an ongoing censorship and pressure from religious groups uh, on, um, on the content of the drama serial. Um, in this sort of somewhat complex and contradictory climate, um, I examined the case study of the Urdu serial drama Odari, which is aid funded uh, in coordination with a locally based no, non-governmental organization called Kash. Um, so uh, before I go into the case of Odari, the, um, um, the use of um, use of Urdu serial drama in this context is actually not new. Um, when um, Salma was talking about Hasina Moin, actually Hasina Moin was one of the first Urdu serial drama writers to work on uh, what might be called, uh, what was called at that time, education, education entertainment, uh, a serial drama that was made in conjunction with John Hopkins Center um, um, of Disease Control in the United States. Uh, it was foreign funded. It was called Ahat, um, and it was talking. Um, it was speaking to um, you know notions of family planning, um, maternal health, uh, maternal and newborn health. Um, so, educa entertainment education has been has been used in the past um, as well in Pakistan. Uh, so, this drama serial nineteen was Ahat was made in nineteen ninety one, um, and it was talking about um, like I said, uh, sort of. Um, uh, ideas around maternal health. However, the new uh, sort of um, educational entertainment, uh, what you might call, that is coming out in um, in a post deregulated uh, television industry is what I'm calling in my article feminist edutainment. And the reason I call it feminist edutainment is that um, it focuses more on 
gender norms rather than um, as opposed to EE focusing more on these um, sort of underlying uh, health concerns. So um, the first example of the example that I want to talk briefly talk about of feminist edutainment is Odari, which was uh, conceived as in response to um, the Kasur incident um, in which, which is the largest sort of uh, pornography scandal in Pakistan. Um, and um, so the, um, just briefly talking about a little bit about the sort of uh, overview, giving you an overview of how these drama seals are produced is that under a broad umbrella of uh, female empowerment, the Canadian government gave funds to this uh, local NGO um, called Kash, uh, which was set up in 1996. Kash is the first uh, specialized microfinance institution of Pakistan and works with like low income households to create more enabling environment for women to run, run and build, build, build and run businesses. Um, it seems on the at first round, it seems to have little to do with te uh, television, but uh, making television is part of uh, um, 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 uh, so, um, developing and commissioning television serial dramas is part of Kash's social advocacy program. So, uh, like I said, um, funding was received under the broad umbrella of female empowerment and then allocated to different projects. Um, and um, the first project that uh, Kash made with this aid funding was called Rehai. Um, and um, there is a bit of difference between Rehai and Odari, which I think that speaks to the sort of rapidly changing nature and commercialization of the Pakistani television industry. So um, uh, when I, um, in my research, I spoke to, um, spoke to the writer of Rehai and, um, and Udari, Farad Ishtiak, um, and I also spoke to the, um, the producer uh, at Kash, and they told me that because of the rapidly changing nature of the, of the Pakistani tele television industry, they also felt uh, the, some pressure to make the co uh, the content more commercially, um, I suppose, viable by adding in more entertainment, entertaining elements to the story. So while the focus was on sexual abuse, there are sort of interweaving uh, story storylines that have to do with music uh, and art in the in Odari as well uh, to keep the audiences attract more, um, you know and. In terms of ratings, because there's a lot of focus on ratings um, in Pakistani television industry, um, the even the uh, sort of when they measure impact of the two serial dramas, one of the things that's really highlighted in the impact assessment report of uh, Odari is that Odari did better than any other serial drama that was playing in the um, in the 8 p.m. time slot, even better than Rehai, and perhaps that is because of the commercial uh, commercialization of the um, of the content, uh, increased uh, commercialization of that content and added element of entertainment. Um, sorry, Rosie, how am I doing on time? Sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, if you could wind up right now, then we'll be able to have a bit of uh, time for the, uh, the cute questions which are coming in, so. Just yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, I just wanted to uh, briefly talk about uh, this case study of Atari, which I think is a very interesting sort of a, um, way of presenting issues like sexual abuse uh, on television, which is uh, perhaps a much needed um, discussion that needs to be had uh, in Pakistani society. So that's about it. Okay, thank you very much, Aish, and thank you to all the uh, all the speakers. So we've got just half an hour, um, or a little bit less than that, for the questions. Um, and um, I'll begin with a question from Eva Loreng. Um, just a brief question: Can Coke Studio Pakistan and Pakistani dramas be considered as a source of Pakistani soft power? Who'd like to take that? Would Salma take it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, of course. I, I mean, you know, I think more than Pakistan, it's uh, evidence of Coca-Cola's uh, soft power in Pakistan. They're opening new and new bottling plants in Pakistan. 
and Coke Studios are part of their 15-year marketing strategy. Their marketing share has increased by 15%. Uh, they were nowhere in certain markets, and now they're there in certain markets. So um, I think Coca-Cola has succeeded. Um, the stuff they were doing back during the World War, uplifting the troops by providing Coca-Cola, and now they're making people feel more attached to it. So in my personal opinion, yes, definitely it has. Uh, but you have to understand that, uh, be it cricket or uh, music, it's usually the fizzy drinks supporting them in Pakistan. And it's always not just the country that's manufacturing soft power. It is also the beverage company or the MNC associated with it that is also benefiting from it. Hey, Rafa, Someone uh, else can talk about grammar. Um, sorry, I've just remembered I've made a terrible mistake. Um, I've completely forgotten that Amina is going to be a respondent and we're dying to hear what Amina has to say. Um, so um, please, Amina, can you come in and give your response and then we'll get to the rest of the questions. I'm really, really sorry. Um, I think I kind of lost track of time with <laughs> all the disruptions. So please, um, and Amina needs no introduction, I'm sure, to our audience. Uh, thank you, Rosie. Not at all. I was, uh, <laughs> I was thinking I've been let off the hook here. So <laughs> I was going to, looking forward to Rafi and the Q and A. Um, thank you all of you for such um, rich and exciting and important interventions in in this kind of debate on televisual Pakistan, which touches on um the ethics of journalism in pakistan you know of the ownership of media of funding of the kind of connections the transnational connections that you're talking about that militate against the very nationalistic content that is being produced and what are the tensions i think that's been really nicely um it, uh, sort of spoken about and, and illustrated in the discussions about um various contexts and the feminist edutainment you know women have always been at um, the heart of um of, of sort of nationalist um mission nationalist projects shall we say uh global certainly in post-colonial societies they've been at the heart of, of projects and this kind of um engagement with with the ngos and um uh, interests with regards to how um, fertility and health are um, managed within Pakistan through the media, television media is 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 a very powerful way of of kind of thinking through who where you know who's the storytelling working for and where does the storytelling um, uh, how far does it go in terms of actually change what kind of publics I suppose that's the question I'm thinking of what kind of publics are watching this and uh, absorbing this transformative kind of idea that is being put forward by by the people who wish development I suppose development led concerns that are coming in via that funding to what extent is that uh, empowering for those women and to what extent does it actually um, you know change those relationships of class that were brought up quite a lot you know what are the kind of con things that happen there with with regards to the commercialization and and all the sort of um and i suppose one of the things that i thought about there um was i mean um aisha was talking about the show udari and i was also thinking about another show and and i think it's it's a per persona and a personality and a context that is that really connects with all of these issues um with regards to the um representation of um transnationalism gender and media cultures in pakistan and i'm thinking of of the context of kandil baloch here as somebody perhaps that we could bring into the con that we should bring into the conversation who was uh, very much a part of this whole uh, narrative you know there was an adaptation as well wasn't there on uh, as a television drama serial um that was played out in which certain parts of the stories story was shared and other parts were not shared you know what's permissible in television who again i think as some of you were talking about that um the the sort of um uh, ownership with regards to the 
accountability. You know, where is the accountability? Who has the accountability? And who can be brought to accountability? And, and then the kind of, because with, with the Kandil Baloch case, it was really interesting where the media industry that has had participated in, in the kind of show and tell around her, her whole story sort of then took a back seat in relation to um, when what happened happened, you know, after her murder. So, and, and wanted to be more participatory in the reclaiming of Kandil Baloch, you know, what were the ethics that were involved in that story? And uh, recently we've, I mean, I don't need to, um, I suppose, remind you of this, but then we've had the, um, the controversy with Khalilur Rahman Kamar, who was in the news for his drama, you know, which broke all sorts of records, Mere Pastam Ho, I Have You, and its misogynistic representation of women, etc. You know, it, it sort of ties in with things like the Women's March and um, and, and the transnational activism of, of Marvi Sirmad and, and the fact that it was okay to um, to say something um, that was quite objectionable and hurtful to a woman, to swear at a woman on live television, to have no intervention from the kind of, uh, from the TV channel. I think it was Neo News who were uh, running that panel debate. And these are the sorts of, and, and the fact that a lot of our media industry celebrities still kind of caught Khalilur Rahman Kamar, and there are women involved in that and men involved in that. And, and that's where I'm really interested to hear about the questions of the middle classes that populate this, this culture and how are they, you know, they complain about the stories that they want in which they would like to participate in that are not available to them. But at the same time, you know, the ownership and the networks of power seem to be very um, challenging. And, and also authoritarian in some ways. I mean, and, and we know that, uh, I mean, this. So, so all of this is really interesting for me. And I also thought with, just to kind of wrap up something that I thought of here, because agenda setting was brought up, I think by Aisha in, in her paper. And that's something that um, <clears throat> I've connected with in my co-authored book, Framing Muslims, uh, <clears throat> Stereotyping Representation After 9-11. Now that doesn't look uh, at Muslims, sort of cult, um, what a Muslim is or who a Muslim is, but just looks at the kind of idea of representation. And one of the things that we, uh, one of the people who we engaged with was Maxwell McCombs and his work in setting the agenda in relation to news media and the idea of the frame, which um, in which, uh, if I can quote, the central organizing idea for news content that supplies a context and suggests what the issue is through the use of selection, emphases, exclusion, and elaboration, frames call our attention to the dominant perspectives in these pictures that not only suggest what is relevant and irrelevant, but that actively promote a particular problem, definition, causal interpretation, moral evaluation, on and or treatment recommendation, recommendation for the item described. And we were talking about the twin concepts of stereotyping and framing being applicable beyond the boundaries of individual disciplines and cultural practices taking forms um, in different media. And, and we were just sort of talking about it around the context of how Muslimness is constructed in a non-Muslim context. But I think you can also reverse that Con, uh, that sort of frame and look at it within a Muslim nation to see how that sort of self constructs Muslimness and um, sets the agenda and also how global media networks, you know, what are the relations of those with the transnational concerns and contexts. So anyway, I, I mean, there's a lot more I can um, say and think about, but I think this is um, a really rich, um, special issue. I would like to congratulate all of you. You know, there's incredible hard work that has gone into it. It's really exciting to hear that early career researchers, you know, have, are kind of leading the path and the field in terms of how we can think, you know, about the new ways of imagining culture within Pakistan and where the tensions lie. And, and I think the you've also opened up that kind of discussion of, of modernity that we always kind of debate and uh, throw around and challenge, be it in cultural studies or modern anthropology. So, so I'll just um, stop there and, and thank you all for your um, contributions and for, for being here today.
Thank you, Amina, thanks. Um, would any of the uh, panelists like to uh, respond to any of uh, Aisha's, the points that Aisha raised, uh, that Amina raised? Um, or shall we go back to the questions? Um, I, I, I have one thing to say because um, um, we talked a little bit about Gandil Baloch um, and you know her life and the sort of serial drama that uh, you know was made about that as well. Um, and I think that to me, while in my larger work, I had I, I did have a look at it because you know the serials like uh, Odari, uh, which are made on social issues that uh, garner really high ratings, um, they lead other commercial producers to make content. Uh, that is similar, which is, you know, could be called about social issues as well. And, you know, is um, they leads producers to make this kind of content. But that sort of um, response, perhaps um, research or responsibility that might go be uh, behind creating content um, and, uh, you know, representing somehow Kandil Baloch or any other uh, person who is the subject of such a um, such a serial uh, responsibly. Um, that is perhaps missing in a lot of the content that um, that is produced about uh, this. And so, I um, in my work, I I, I I do look a lot a lot at you know content that is produced uh, about you know current issues, uh, but perhaps. I myself am a little perplexed by how uh, one can sort of have that um, balance between uh, sensationalism and dealing with content responsibly. And I think that, that those are sort of the uh, contradictions that, um, that are worth exploring. Thanks. Any other panelists want to uh, come into that? Okay, I'm going to go back to the questions. So there's quite a few and we don't have long. Um, there's a question for, a couple of questions for Aisha. Um, and uh, first one from Munira Chima. I'm interested in knowing more about the theoretical framework used in Aisha Muller's work. Aisha, can you briefly, uh, respond to that. Sure, Rosie. And I, I was looking at the questions. I think we have access to them too. And so I was saying, do you want me to just throw some yeah. of the questions <laughs> yeah. together? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think there was a question on like sort of the ethics and like how I actually was able to like observe uh, some of these things playing out. And so, um, you know, for obviously those who weren't able to read the article yet, um, my fieldwork was actually placed in a journalism training center. And I, the timing of it was just really lucky. Uh, I was in Pakistan and this like first center for training journalists sort of shows up in Karachi, uh, funded by the US government, a uh, very generous grant. And so it's, it was this, you know, sort of gleaming center where we had these new journalists sort of coming in uh, every week for these sessions. And uh, what was very striking was that they were entry level journalists, they were hired as journalists, but then they were also being trained to be journalists. And so that figure of the untrained journalist really features uh, in my work. And so the, the framework that I'm really looking at when I'm looking at, at these as my primary interlocutors is a framework of aspiration. Uh, and I think it's interesting how uh, the news media industry becomes an aspirational uh, site as an aspirational profession uh, for lower to middle class uh, entry, sort of job entry or uh, entrance into the job market. Uh, and it ties into sort of politics of desirability, politics of respectability that we're seeing in sort of, you know, parallel realms of, of media in drama and cinema. and television news uh, provides a somewhat of a stable uh, aspirational uh, income bracket for, for these groups. And so the, the ethics of journalism then plays out within these sort of entry level new journalists uh, who are both sent out to cover 
you know, report or cover stories in uh, unscrupulous ways and then are scapegoated by their management as well. So it's sort of, you know, a hire and fire at will. Um, and so they're using that rawness of that untrained journalist to go ask those questions that will, you know, elicit these responses live on camera. And then these journalists come to these training centers complaining of the treatment they receive in their newsrooms, you know, where they're sent out to go make up the news. So for example, you know, whatever the political agenda of the day was, uh, uh, to say, you know, there's no petrol, like, you know, go find me some box pops of people on the street complaining uh, that, you know, there's no petrol today. Uh, and so then they'd go out with their report with their camera crew uh, and they wouldn't find they wouldn't, that wouldn't be the case. You know, there's petrol available, but they have to come back with that report. And so they'd ask people to lie on camera. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're narrating these stories to senior Pakistani journalists in the training institute. And, and, you know, there's sort of like a gas shock and sort of like, how could you do that? Like, how could you ask someone to lie on camera? That's not news, that's unethical. Um, and then these, you know, entry level journalists are sort of like, well, that was my job description. Like I was asked to go do that. And so the directive from senior level sort of privileged uh, journalists is you have to flat out refuse that. You have to, you know, you know, you just quit your job. And that's not an option for entry level journalists. You know, it's sort of, there's sort of, there, was a, there was a very sort of tangible disconnect between privileged labor uh, and then those that are coming into the industry. Uh, and I think that kind of um, tension doesn't really translate onto screens. And so we don't see it as much as we will hear about untrained journalists uh, being critiqued by their seniors uh, in you know, newspaper editorials. Um, and there's so many instances of you know, journalists in the news and the complaint is, you know, journalists don't know how to not involve themselves in the story. So oftentimes we'll see like this untrained journalist become the story, right? Like she like slapped a guard outside of, you know, a building, this became the story. And so we have to fix this problem of untrained journalists in Pakistan. Uh, and so the center that I was at was a fascinating space where, you know, they're addressing this problem of untrained journalists, um, but it's also sort of masking over larger issues of class disparities, educational disparities in Pakistan. Um, and then obviously the, the main question is also like, this is an Urdu mass medium. And so it's very relevant that the, the caliber of sort of journalism that they're looking for is not necessarily being uh, translated in educational institutes. And so there's a, there's a much, much larger problem of sort of, you know, training the labor that needs to fill these newsrooms. Um, and so, yeah, I'd say in a sort of convoluted way to talk about it. It, it is my, my work really looks at these, uh, this industry as an aspirational industry um, for entry level journalists. Okay. Um, there's a few questions for Rafe. Um, um, should I take them together or? Yeah, why don't you rather than me? Shall I read yeah. out or do you want to just weave something that, I mean, we've got All one. Right. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. We've got one about the patriotic intros uh, to Coke Studio were a thing during the time Rahel Hyatt was not producing the show. Um, and um, it, do you think that Hyatt doesn't necessarily approach Coke Studio as a Pakistani nation building project, but rather as a more transnational South Asian harmonizing project, if it can be called that, is from Uzair Ibrahim. Uh, all right, I'll start from here. Okay, so to sum it up for you, uh, Uzair, this was a very interesting conversation I had with Rohil Hayat in December. And I did ask him that why did this season not kick off with that sound of the nation? And as much as covertly and subtly, he uh, was of the opinion that he doesn't appreciate sound being associated with any sense of nationhood because sound itself being so transnational um, in its nature. So, but his take was that, you know, they allow me to take the creative freedom as far as the musicality is concerned. So I let them take the freedom of marketing and putting out controversial and sometimes questionable taglines to sell the show. But as far as the notion of harmony is concerned, this was very much the idea behind Coke Studio when it started, because that is how a brand like Coca-Cola company came on board because the whole nation of harmony or cross-cultural inclusion uh, was very much in sync with their brand identity. So you have to understand that how 
he conceived it. He was very smart on Rohail Hayats and that he conceived it in a way that there was enough for the brand to take away from that, to sum that question up. I think Hayat's version of Coke Studio is very much this, but, but the four or five episodes that we see from Strings, I think have a lot to do with Strings belonging to the Anwar Maksud family, which is this family from North India and embraces the whole creation of Pakistan in a very spiritual sense, something reflective, um, reflected in Fatma Suraya Bajia's novels and Zaira Negas poetry and even Anwar Maksud's writing. So I take Bilal Maksud's Coke Studio as an extension of that mentality, which is why you do see a lot of Urdu classics coming uh, in the season and a lot of, you know, um, other national languages as complained by a lot of people being ignored on those seasons. Uh, the other question by Bidhu is, um, are divisive or inclusive from a transnational perspective? The studio produces programs to reach the audience crossing the border. The same thing for the nationalist Pakistanis. You know, the thing with Coke Studio is that the essence of Coke Studio is giving a cosmopolitan representation to traditional music. It's very simple. So traditional music is the same as it goes from Nangarhar in Afghanistan to all the way to Nepal. You have the same notes, you have the same renditions, you have the same folk swings working around it. So I think in terms of its musicali music, uh, musicality, yes, they've included a Rajasthani singer. Even in Coke Studio season 10, they um, included a female singer from Umar Kot who used to sing uh, Krishna's bhajans, who used to rend uh, render bhakti which was uh, covered in the BTS of the song, but what she sang in the studio was essentially Sufi poetry. So uh, that become, brings, uh, that sort of leads to the question that is Coke Studio sort of quite subtly trying to push the boundaries or is it trying to sort of tick all the boxes and yet stay in the safe hands of very much the state-focused notion of nationhood? Because one question that bothers me as a culture writer and a commentator is that one thing that Coke Studio hasn't overcome is the marginalized culture, such as the Balots and the Pukhtuns being shown, treated and choreographed like museum pieces and not as such cosmopolitan citizens of the music world. I hope that answers it. Great, thanks very much. Um, We've got a question from Richard Patterson. Please explain in more detail the trade in programs and signal audience viewing overlap between Pakistan and India, India and Bangladesh, Bangladesh and Pakistan. Um, I don't know whether anyone here has any overview of that. Salma, do you have anything to say on that or? Um. I, mean, I would not risk talking about India and Bangladesh, but I'm sure like, um, I mean, as, as Ritika's article mentions that, and this is of course something that my respondents in Pakistan also told me, is that people who live close to the borders receive signals, right? So it's very easy for them at any point in time to um, catch those signals, watch the programs that are being telecast in the language that they understand. Um, so this was the case, um, of people living um, in Pakistan near the border areas in the 70s and 80s as well, 80s especially, where uh, they would often tune into, um, and this is not trade by the way, this is just people catching signals and watching it, it's not official. So this is what one of my respondents said that we would tune into um, Chitrahar, which was the uh, Indian program for film music. And you know they said we had heard these songs for a long time on radio and then suddenly we saw them and we didn't like what we saw. So, I mean, this is also, you know, what you hear for a long time and suddenly you see them on television. He said, we saw Rajesh Khanna, we were like, what's this? Uh, but uh, at the same time, um, Zindagi, what Ritika writes about Zindagi channel was actually um, in some ways something unprecedented in India because they actually had a channel just dedicated to uh, content from Pakistan. Uh, and it was short lived in the sense that it lasted for, I think, less than two years and it was banned. Um, and this sort of brings me to the question around soft power. So if one were to think in those terms, I would say that people who are alert to the idea of soft power do recognize the presence of these 
uh, serious and the actors as soft power, which is why they are the first to go away, which is why, you know, uh, Fawad Khan will be expelled or, you know, stopped from working in India. It's not because they are worried about him making money in India, but they are worried about the fact that he um, makes Pakistan more sexy and more desirable. <laughs> and so this is how, um, you know, if, so I think in that sense, yes, soft power of um, these dramas do work to a certain extent in India, um, of Pakistan through these dramas. So, um, and yeah, I think uh, as far as I know, there is an official ban in Pakistan on Indian television, but of course satellite providers or you know, your local cable wala will uh, sometimes offer that fare locally and you know people do watch it so uh, there is enough familiarity with the genres of the Saz Bahu serials you know people have watched it in the past and you can also see it in the um, dramas that are coming from Pakistan where they mention you know there is a lot of intertextuality you know you are watching too many Indian TV serials or like that so there is familiarity there is and of course with the YouTube and all I mean all these uh, everybody is now uh, watching whatever they want to watch and it's available so to, to the extent it's available in in their regions yeah yeah, yeah. Um, if I may add, quickly just add something that's something that I've also always encountered in terms of cultural exchanges one thing that Pakistani producers are really annoyed at the annoyed at is when Indian films were being imported to Pakistan Pakistani films were not being played in India and this has remained a point of contention for the artists, for the stakeholders, whether they're exhibitors or producers. So if you're looking at the transnational flow of content in a legal way, so yeah. that always remains a point of contention that yes, you are getting Indian films and the local cinema is benefiting a lot from that economy of the distributor exhibitor system. But what about Pakistani films, let's say, because the total Pakistani cinema uh, market is smaller than the market of Delhi as a whole in terms of screens. So expanding that to a bigger country with the similar nuances in terms of culture, that remains a point of contention and debate, regardless of whether there was a ban or not. Okay, thank you very much. And I see that we're now at 3.30 exactly, and I've been warned that we need to uh, get off air as soon as possible. So I would like to say a very big thank you to all our participants and to Amina and to Soaz and to all the people in the audience who've stayed with us to this point. Um, and I hope that you all managed to get, get hold of or get access to uh, the special issue and do just get in touch with Sama or me if you want to actually follow up anything else by email on afterwards. Okay, so that's all from me. Um, Amina, I don't know if you want to wind um, up to your event. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think uh, we, we don't have time to discuss things like Imam Online and um, many other kind of communalist programming uh, that sets the airwaves on fire across uh, India and Pakistan, Pakistan and India. So it's uh, something perhaps to save for another uh, time and for another special issue. So thank you um, to all of you for being here today and for, um, for kind of um, really raising some compelling contexts and ideas and I and I really um, actually one of the things from uh, uh, the articles I think the neo-global flows is is something that uh, stays with me from I think it was from Pant's article um, and and from all your pieces you know soft power and and cook studio and and um, um, yeah and the power of, of uh, poetry uh, that is hum de king a and and how that becomes um, commercialized and and sort of softened in in different ways as uh, lots lots of things you've given us to take away from today's session and um, yeah as a, once the recording is available we will uh, share it um, it will go out on on the media pages for the South Asia Institute on the SOAS YouTube channel and uh, we do look forward to seeing everyone um, next week if you can join us when we have um, Ali Asghar Asha with us doing um, interview the, the 
this is going to kick off um, the Center for uh, Pakistan Studies student-led seminar series contributions. So it's starting with an in-conversation uh, with a Hazara artist from Pakistan. So please do join us uh, next week. Sunil, I think, is it the 25th? Uh, I'm just trying to remember. I don't yes, know. Tw 25th. 25th. I'll, I'll put the link in the chat box. Okay, brilliant. Yeah. So um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you, the audience. <laughs>